um, back long story short, when I when I was over in Europe and we had dealt with some of these, I I came back from uh, this trip where the the big Canaanite altar had been done, and I just had been gone for three months. That that whole trip was a three month ordeal, and I was ready to make a beeline home and and take some rest and. My wife and children had been over with me for part of it. They had come back to Oklahoma, and I was missing my family. I just wanted to get off the plane, and I had a car in New York because my brother lives there, and we had drove out there to visit with him and some friends. And I just wanted to make a beeline home in my car and not stop for anything but gas. When I landed in New York, the Holy Spirit said to me, I know you want to get home. I know you're missing your family, but I need you to do one more thing before you go. And he said, the timing is important. Before you go back to Oklahoma, go down to Jekyll Island, Georgia. Jekyll Island. And I said, Lord, I don't even know. You know, I, I knew something about Jekyll Island. I, I had looked at some of the financial issues uh, in the 80s and 90s. I was looking at some of the... Uh, spiritual applications to uh, financial things, but I really did not, was not up to speed on the history of Jekyll Island. I had just heard it from something. I had not even read, the, you know, the book that's called The Creature of Jekyll Island. I had not even read that book, but I was aware of something about Jekyll Island and financial stuff. So so I, I, I went in my brother's house, got my computer out, and I just you know, got on the Internet and typed in Jekyll Island. It's like, what's going on with Jekyll Island? And and was praying and asking the Lord, why do I need to go there? And he said, when you get there, I will explain to you why what you need to do. But he said, he just told me, he says, go, go to the island and and plan to spend. Uh, it's, a, it's not that far from New York, but he said, I, I need you to, to tarry for a day or two. And listen to me, I'll tell you what to do. So uh, I discovered when I got online that the Jekyll Island Club, which was this historical, um, you know, multi-millionaires country club that had been built in the turn of the century, it had just been remodeled and reopened. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And immediately the Spirit of the Lord said, that's where I want you, book a room there. And so I uh, I just booked me a, a room for that night and got in the car and headed that way. Um, all the way down there, I'm driving and I'm praying. And, I'm, and I don't like, I know when the Lord tells me to do something like that, I have to obey. At the same time, I'm one of these guys that I don't like doing anything alone. I don't think God sends people alone. I think he he often wants us to go in twos or threes, right. and I'm not I'm not afraid to go along. But it's just like, Lord, where's my little buddy Leahu? Where's my you know? There's got to be something important, or God would not be diverting me. And, and I don't know anybody in Jekyll Island, you know. So I'm thinking, who do I know in Georgia that I can call? Maybe maybe there's somebody that can come over and join me. And and I just was complaining a little bit. It's like, Lord, I'm tired. I've been gone for a long time. I'd really rather be going home. What's so important about Jekyll Island that i got to go there now? And the Lord just encouraged me. He's like, son, please don't complain. I don't ask you to do something unless it's important. I'm directing your steps, and this must be done now. So uh, I quit complaining and grumbling, and I just started praying and cheering up and so I tried to just pray in the spirit all the way down there. When I got to the um when I got to the hotel, it was about nine o'clock at night. And um as a, one of the things that I've I've learned is that whenever God's doing something territorially, he almost always has someone on site that's ready to open the door to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I call them gatekeepers. You know, in Chronicles, David ordained 4,000 gatekeepers as king. And, and we need to understand that anointing a little better. That's another story. But I, I, I often come into a place, if it's the first time I'm there, and I'm asking the Lord, connect me up with who you already know or who you got your hand on that's, that's able to open the door to your spirit and what you want to do. 
And so I expect God to order my steps, and I'm, I'm, I try to go with my ears and my eyes open looking for the local that God has his hand on. And they're not always hard to find if, you, if you're praying that way. So I walked into the hotel, and the, the lady behind the desk calls out my name. She says, are you Mr. Benz? And I said, boy, you're really good at your job because I hadn't said anything yet. She said, well, you're the last one to check in. I just kind of figured that you must be Mr. Pence. Mm. So it was just a little bit of an exchange that was odd. It was not a normal way to start a conversation on her end. I was a little bit impressed that she was up to speed on her job and she knew who I was. So I asked her, I said, you know, did you, do you, like, look at all the names? How did you know I was the only one left? And she said, well, I was actually here last night. When you booked your reservation, I assigned you your room last night. So I was realized that you had not checked in yet, so I was looking for you. So I said, well, okay. And then she got this real funny look on her face. And I, I know I, I know when, if that kind of looked like she's sitting there, like she wants to say something else but isn't sure if she should. And I asked her, I said, you know, um, I'm here for a real interesting purpose, and if you know something else, please tell me. She goes, oh, I, no, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I should say it. And I said, no, I want to hear it. So I looked at her and I said, look, I'm I'm a spiritual man and I, I believe God's doing something with me and I need to be here, but I don't know why I'm here. So I looked at her and said, you work here. You live in this area. Why am I here? And she said, well, I did hear something really strange when I booked your reservation, but I don't have that kind of experience very often, so I, I, it's uncomfortable for me to say it. I said, well, please please tell me just whatever you know. Don't don't worry about it. I, I, I experience this kind of stuff all the time. She said, well, I was sitting in the office, and I was booking the reservations, and when your reservation came in off, over, the, over the Internet, I assigned you your room. I said, well, that's not unusual. So what, what did you do? What, like, what, what made that different? She said, well, I heard this voice inside me, and that's never happened to me before. I said, what did you hear? She said, I heard this voice said, he's an ambassador. I'm sending him. Give him the presidential suite. And she, she looked at me. She says, are you a real ambassador that's kind of incognito or something? Because I looked up your name, and you're not a country, an ambassador of a country. You know? I said, I, I kind of laughed. I said, I'm not an ambassador of a nation that you understand, but I was sent by the Lord Jesus. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, and the word ambassador is one that's sent on an errand. I'm representing him. I am here to represent him. And I said, he's the one that's important that's coming on your hotel site, not me. And she said, well, I, I, I gave you the presidential suite. But I was kind of thought it interesting what I heard because I've never, I'm not, that's not normal for me to hear something like that. And so I said, do you know Jesus? Do you know the Lord? As you're saying, she said, yeah, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus. I just don't hear like that. So I said, well, did you hear anything else? She said, yes. As a matter of fact, there was one other thing. I I heard that I needed to give you the presidential suite, that you needed to be here for two nights, not one. So I booked your reservation just like you asked for it, but I've also reserved you for another night. And I did that without pay. I'm applying your payment to both nights. So you're getting the presidential suite for the price of one night, for two nights. And she said, I heard that I needed to introduce you to the gentleman that is in charge of our museum on the island and a few others that work here at the hotel that have lived here most of their lives. I said, okay. Um, that sounds like you heard a word from God. And don't ever be afraid of that. Listen to his voice and let him lead and guide your steps. And thank you very much for telling me. 
this is going to be fun. We're going to figure out what he wants to do. <laughs> and I had no idea that it would relate to some of the other things, but I just thought that was so much fun. It was like I, one minute I'm feeling alone, another minute it's like God's already got somebody on site that's hearing him and obeying him. Even though it's her first time to have an experience like that, she was obeying what she heard. That's what's critically important when we're doing spiritual warfare. It's not just to run into the battlefield and try to take down the demons, but it's to hear and obey. So anyway, I it was 9 o'clock. Uh, she texts me in and she tells me, we'll take care of your bag. We'll, we'll have the valet park your car. She said, your room includes supper and breakfast. And the restaurant's only open till 10, so if you want to, go right on in there and get you a meal. We'll get your stuff up to your room, and you can go up there a little bit. And then you need to come down sometime before 10 o'clock and, and have your breakfast. And so I, I went in the restaurant and had a good meal and uh, went to my room and got some rest. And the next morning I went down for breakfast, and uh, a different different lady was at the desk, but she... She had a note for me and said that I that I had an appointment arranged with the uh, museum director and that he was blocking out most of the day to spend with me. So I had my breakfast and then when I, I went over to meet with him. Um, again, I'm just there. I don't know personally yet why I'm there. I'm just hearing and obeying what I do know. And but I'm rested and I'm well fed and I've been taken good care of and the presidential suite was fabulous and it was like Lord why did you give me this I I didn't ask for it I didn't ask for a, you know a, a special VIP treatment why are you doing this so when I asked the lady at the desk um, the one that I had met the night before was not there so I said. You know, this is a pretty nice room, what you guys put me in. And she looked at me. She goes, no one has stayed in that room since 1948. It's been totally remodeled. You're the first guest that actually has stayed in there since it's remodeled. She said, the last person that stayed there was the actual president. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I'm sitting there just pondering the idea that not getting caught up in the luxury of the room, but just thinking, what is it about that room that God was wanting to invade? And thinking it's not about me having a nice king-size bed and, and some luxury. It's about him coming in and doing something himself. Why did he need the presidential suite? Why does he want to do something in Jekyll Island? And those are the way I'm questioning and praying. So I go meet with the museum gentleman. His name is John. And when I go meet with him, I just introduce myself. I told him a little bit about who I was and what I do. Uh, he was not a very spiritual guy, so he he, what, he respected it. But he he just kind of told me right off the bat, you know, I uh, I I don't. I don't really understand prayer and intercession, that kind of stuff. He said, I believe in God, but I'm not very spiritual. Then I said, well, that's okay. You're still important. I need. There's something you know that I need to know. And I said, I don't know if you'll understand it, but the king of kings set this appointment up. There's something you know I need to know. And I'll pray for you, and I'll pray for the business here, and I'll pray for whatever it is that God wants, but... Just please attend to this as something very, very important, you know. And thank you for your time. So um, we started talking. Uh, he was, of course, started out talking about the financial stuff because this Jekyll Island is where the Federal Reserve banking system was birthed and conceived. And at, at one time, when it was functioning in the 1900s up to the 20s and 30s. Uh, uh, some say one third, some say two thirds of the world's wealth would vacation on that island. Mm -hmm. It was the highest conglomeration of wealth 
in a single place very often anywhere in the world back in the turn of the century. So uh, it this seems like a little island that's not anything significant at all now, but it's amazing to see the financial side of the history of that spot. And so I, I'm sitting there looking at some of the the things that he's telling and just thinking about some of the things he's telling me. We went out walked around and he showed me some of the cottages that had been restored and the, the club itself and the, the rack of the tennis courts and you know the, they had a pier where the boats would come up and he's just kind of showing me the grounds and then we go to the museum and he's talking a lot about the financial stuff and the guys that built it and each cottage was you know, marked in names. Some of them had been restored. Some of them didn't exist anymore, but they had like a sign that this is where this one was, and that one was built by J.P. Morgan, that one was Rockefeller's, and, you know, that one was uh, just, they they had each one of them named. Well, they're all kind of native names, and then they're all, you know, got some kind of plaque on who the financial mogul was that had built them. And they're not really elaborate, luxurious mansions. They're just simple cottages for the most part, which was kind of interesting to know that the richest people in the world built them and they were very low key and almost like a you know, cabin in the woods instead of a luxurious house like you'd expect. And they all had Indian names. So I started asking them about the Indian history of the island and he lit up. He just was like, that's what he really wanted to talk about because he loved the Indian history. And so he, uh, he he takes me back to the museum and he said, we got a lot of stuff on the Indians. He said, this was uh, actually uh, like the uh, government um, main uh, main community for a tribe of Indians that don't exist anymore. And that tribe was called the Tim Yukas. And I said, well, that's interesting. My name's Tim. And... Uh, Anyway, I didn't know anything about the Timucas. I'm from Oklahoma. I've, I've learned a lot of Native history, and I have some Native bloodline, but I did not know anything about the Timucas. Um, so I just asked him, please tell me everything that you can tell me about them. I want to. There's something about the Natives that I feel like I need to know. So um, he said, well, the Jekyll Island Club was actually built on top of everything that the Indians had. So they just kind of wiped the village out and built the club on top of it. So wherever the chief's house was, there was a cottage now. Wherever the council house was, there was now the Jekyll Island Hotel. And he said everything that's built and visible today was is actually sitting right on top of something that was significant in the Indian village when it existed. So he said the fact that this whole place had to go into ruins and then be rebuilt and become an archaeological state park, he said it actually helped us identify the Native history because the club itself had almost erased that. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, you know, let's look at the museum. I want to see some of the Indian stuff. So we're looking at arrowheads and spear tips and, you know, just artifacts that they had found and pottery shards and things and seashells that they had had. And he showed me all their stuff in the museum. Um, he he shows me some fragments of a weapon that was like an unusual bow. And when I say unusual, I mean that it was a, a like a double-curved bow. And that was a very unusual shape of a bow for a native tribe. I had never seen that shape before with an American Indian tribe. And I've seen a lot of bows and arrows, so... I asked him, I said, this seems unusual. I've not seen this before. In Oklahoma, every native tribe, the bows would look like a single bow or just a, a single curve. I said, this is quite extraordinary, especially as far back as this tribe was. So um, he said, yeah, we found a lot of weapon-type artifacts that we, we've not seen with other tribes. And I said, well, how do you know these were Native Americans? Maybe they were from somewhere else. He said, oh, no, 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 they, they were, they tell you, because they, you know, they, they're well established along the Florida and Georgia uh, coast, and he said, we got a lot of stuff in, in three or four states about them, and 
They were quite prolific at one time. So he said, we know they're Native Americans. I said, well, all right, what else you got? He said, well, we got some skeletons. He said, you want to see this, the bones? And I said, well, yeah. You know, that sounds, you don't get to see a skeleton very often. I said, are they where we can actually see them or are they buried? He said, no, they're visible. So they had a burial site that they had been very respectful for when they built the museum. When they found a burial site, they didn't move the bones. They left them where they were, and they just uncovered them to where they were visible, and then they built the museum on top of them. They did basically the same thing with the museum that the Jekyll Island guys had done with their houses. They put a piece of plexiglass over the burial site so you could see it, but they were still trying to respect where the bones were and not move them. And so I'm looking at four skeletons of the Timuca chiefs. And uh, they knew they were chiefs just from different things that were buried with them. So all of a sudden I looked and I realized, man, these guys are really tall. And I commented to the guy that, you know, how tall are these guys? They look unusually large. And he said, yeah, they're all about eight or eight and a half foot tall. I'm like, well, that doesn't seem like a normal Native American, especially the tribes that I'm familiar with. He said all the Timucas were unusually tall, even the women. And he said we found other skeletons and you know parts parts of bones out in the grounds. And he said uh, we've got pretty good evidence that nearly all of them were extraordinarily tall. And I said, well, what is you know what? How do you explain that in relation to other tribes on the Atlantic coast who were not? He said, I don't know. It is an unusual anomaly. He said, oh, by the way, I've got a painting that you might want to see. It's actually the copy of the original. We've got it under lock and key. But he said, I've got a painting that, that actually shows the Indians uh, from a, a, a group of French colonists that came to the United States uh, before it was the U.S. This was right after Columbus. He said that it was the first colony of French uh, folks that came over to try to establish a colony on the coast. And he said they landed in Jekyll Island, and they had some interaction with these Indians. And then they got so uh, appalled by what they saw and witnessed that they fled at night and ended up in San Augustine, Florida, and established that city. So I said, were they the Huguenots who were the French group that established San Augustine? He said, yes. I said, well, I'd like to see that painting then. So he pulls that out. I'm looking at it, and it shows the Indians and all their regalia, and they're dancing around and having some kind of a ceremony, and it's got the fire, and it's got just, it's a typical, either they're having a party or they're having a war scene, and and it, it has um, some things with the weapons, so I said, gosh, this has got some weapons in it that clearly validates the archaeology that they found. And then I see an altar, and I'm going, I don't know of a Native American tribe anywhere in the country. I know some that had log houses or high places or worshipped, you know, nature in some way or had totem poles or that kind of stuff, but this one has a stone altar, and it looks a whole lot like the one that I had dealt with in the Middle East. And... I'm looking at the picture and I'm going, is this an altar? Is this stone like something they're sacrificing on? Because this guy's holding babies in his hands in this picture. He said, yeah, they're cutting those babies. They're hacking those babies up in that painting. And so what? when you look at the detail, two of the shamans or chiefs are holding a baby up by the ankles and they're whacking their heads off and spilling the blood on this altar. Mm. And I'm like, sir, I, I don't want to be disrespectful of your training and archaeological understanding and history, but I don't know of any Native tribe that did what I'm seeing here unless it was a, an act of war. And this is really, really unusual. And I've seen this type of scene with artifacts over in the Middle East. And I've seen weapons like this 
over in the Middle East. I said, are you sure this is Native Americans and not some kind of colony that came from over there? And he he was convinced they were Native. And I said, well, I'd like to show you some things on a few websites that identify artifacts in the in the Middle East countries, and especially Egypt and Israel and Syria and Jordan area, and I, some of those spots where there's some of these ancient groups. And I said, these, this type of altar, this type of religious ceremony, and some of these weapons, I've seen them before over there. Well, he was quite interested in that because he loves Native American history, but he's starting to question now, maybe I need to dig into this more. That's, that was his comment. So I said, at that point, then I thought, I believe this is why I'm here. I needed, I needed to see this and, and hear about this. Now, you know, at this point, I'm not that concerned about the financial stuff anymore. I'm wanting to know where is this altar. And so I asked him. I said, can you, can I, can you take me to this altar? Uh, I often pray over these things, and it's very beneficial for the land and for the country and for the people. Can can I go to this altar and see it? He said, I can take you to the altar, but you can't see it. And I said, why can't I see it? Is it buried? He said, no, no, it's not buried, but it has a house built on top of it. I said, who would be crazy enough to build their house on top of a blood sacrifice altar? He said, well, Rockefeller was. So, you know, I just like, okay, uh, can we go there? And he said, yeah, it's just a short walk. Come on. And we've actually, you know, I'd already walked by it. So he said, uh, I've got the keys. He said, normally nobody can go in. Um, they the, the way these things are set up, they're historical homes now. The state of Georgia owns the park. Uh, they lease out to another group, the hotel, to run. But the houses are maintained on the National Historical Register, and they're part of the state park. So you can't go in any of them without a guided tour or permission, but you can go look in the windows and walk on the porches and walk all around them, and they're, they're set up inside just like they were when they were actually being used in the, back in the 20s and, and earlier. So uh, we we go over there, and he's got the keys, though. so we go into the house, and he takes me into the parlor, and he says, well, I know you're, you're a praying guy, so you probably would like to have a little time to pray. He said, you're standing right on top of the altar right now. This is the room that is built on top of it. He said, I'm just going to go over here and sit down for a few minutes and read the newspaper, and I'll let you pray and do whatever you need to do. Now, this parlor, that's where thats where those guys, J.P. Morgan and all those guys, actually conceived of the Federal, Federal Reserve, right? Right over that that's, altar? That's exactly right. It's the room that they were sitting in when they drew wow. up the, the, uh, the entire legislation and plan to pass it that became the Federal Reserve Act. Wow. So this was the conception of the Federal Reserve Banking System on the parlor sitting on top of a blood sacrifice altar. Where babies were sacrificed. Yes. And so all of a sudden it's like, wow, no wonder our banking system has so much corruption in it, even when people want to do the right thing, you know. No kidding. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just being a banker is not an easy job, but it's like not all of them are bad guys, but it's like, wow. And that was not what our founders set up. That took over. It usurped the authority of the way our founding fathers suggested that we bank as a country. And even the way it was passed had a lot of, you know, things that didn't seem right about it. Um, but the the idea that it was conceived like this, I'm going, this is not just a bunch of wealthy guys that got away for vacation and came up with a profitable business plan. This has got something diabolical, something occultic about it, something evil that's wrapped up with it. Yeah. And so even if 
even if it had been a good idea and something beneficial for the country, which many would argue that it was, um, this demonic power must have gotten into it. That's what happens when an altar is not dealt with. That's what happens when God's people do not do spiritual warfare the way he tells us to. Right. Then we all become subject to it because they didn't just create a bank. They created a banking system that every one of us have have become subject to. So, So think about this. You've got money that you receive as a ministry or that you, when you earn, I'm sure you tithe and give offerings. On your right. money is idolatry. It's printed right on your money. Right. And, and you're using that money. You're coming into the house of God, and you're laying that idolatrous coin or dollar bill on God's altar and saying, I'm giving you this as an offering. Wow. Well, what wow. if the living holy God hates it? Wow. We, we don't have a choice because it's we're subject to it. Yeah, it's that's why the they, call it, they, call it, they call it circulation because that's exactly what we're doing. We're circulating a, a talisman that has evil attached to it right from its conception. Is it possible? Now, I'm not saying that's that Lord here, but is it possible that a lot of the financial blessings and a lot of the things that God has promised his people and that we're supposed to be the head and not the tail and we're supposed to be um, you know we ought to be running the the world in a righteous holy way not not ruling over people in a mean way but just bringing wisdom to the every single industry I think it's real possible that the reason why many people in the body of Christ struggle financially, even when they're doing God's perfect will, even when they're walking out their ministries as best they know, is because we're forced to do business with something idolatry, and we must be bringing us tents before God dies when we give him an offering with it. Wow. That's why he says, that, you know, I don't want your offerings. I want I want praise. I want worship. I want prayer. You know, uh, I mean, it's it's tough because whatever everything we do, I mean, from eating to living and electricity, I mean, everything we do costs money. I mean, it's we're trapped in a in an evil system. That's what I'm saying. That we become subject to it against our will. Uh, either we didn't resist and say no, we don't want that. We we didn't elect our representatives to represent us correctly because they deviated from righteous wisdom when they passed this bill to allow idolatry to become the circulated means of exchange. It's And the fact that we are subject to that says there's something wrong in the land, not just something wrong with our hearts. There's defilement in the land, and then there's defilement in our hearts. And all right, now to relate that to scripture in in one way, without deviating too much from the story, I, I want to tell you the rest of the altar part. But uh, when I was in Israel the last time, I was studying out with some of the rabbis that I know that passage of scripture on Jesus turning over the table. And I was meeting with some Orthodox rabbis, but they were respectful of the fact that I believe that Jesus is or Yeshua is the Messiah, and I asked them some hard questions, and they asked me some too. But one of the questions I asked them was, why did Yeshua need to turn over the tables at the temple? What was going on? I assumed and had been told by other pastors and ministers that they were probably cheating people at those tables. They weren't giving them a fair exchange. They were, you know, using dishonest scales, and Jesus knew they were cheating, so he threw their tables over. I got quite a different answer from the rabbis. One of them pulled a coin out, and he said, this is an ancient coin. I carry it around because it was minted here in Jerusalem, and it was discovered and found by a friend of mine when we came back to the land in 1948. It was found on the vicinity of the Temple Mount. And he said this was called a Jerusalem shekel. It was minted from the time of David all the way up 
to the time of um, the temple being destroyed in 70 A.D. Only it was changed once during that period. He said, when David ordered coins to be minted, it had a menorah on it. But during the days of Herod, this coin had the same weight, the same, you know, constitution. It was, it was mostly silver, and it it was a, a set weight exchange. But he said they changed the picture on it. It was no longer menorah. It was the face of Baal. Yeah. And so he had the one that had Baal's face on it. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, I said, you're you're a holy man. I can tell you love God with all your heart. Doesn't it bother you to carry that coin around? He said, yes, but that's why I carry it around. It reminds me how easy it is for Israel to become subject to idolatry. Yeah, us too. Because, it, because he said it was priests that minted this coin with the face of Baal. Wow. And it was, it was a wicked king named Herod who ordered us to do it. And it was Rome's influence that gave us a benefit for doing it by making it something circulating that would make us wealthy but not holy anymore. And so he said, when Jesus, when, when, and he said, I'm not going to try to tell you that I think Yeshua is the Messiah. I, I, he was pretty adamant that I don't agree with you on that. But I'm searching that out because my best friend lived his whole life trying to prove that that was not accurate. And he died telling all of us in this room that he had come to the conclusion that Yeshua was the Messiah. And because he was my best friend, I'm searching that out in the scriptures now for myself. So he said, however, whether that's the case or not, historically, if that's accurate, what, what Yeshua did, he did Israel the greatest service when he turned those tables over. I said, I don't understand. Why, why, what, what exactly did he do? He said, he said publicly, this, my father's house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. He said, that phrase doesn't mean you're cheating people at the table. It means you're robbing men of their souls. Wow. And he said the reason was because Herod required a, a temple tax and the priests of that day were corrupt and they required tithes and offerings and taxes to be paid. And the rules in Scripture was that whenever a census was taken, a half a shekel for every male had to be paid, whether you were poor or not. And he said Rome required a census to be done every year so they could collect the tax. And so he said to pay that tax, you had to come into the temple and pay it with a shekel or a half shekel. And the only shekels that were allowed were ones with the face of Baal on it. Wow. The face of Baal in the temple of Jehovah. Yes. Wow. So, so Jesus was saying to the whole city that day, stop giving your money to these priests. Stop putting it in that offering plate. Wow. Don't do this anymore. You're robbing your sons and daughters of their souls because you're trying to bring something idolatrous in front of the face of a living God. Oh, man. I mean, I, I've, I've been saying that without even know what I'm, knowing what I'm saying because this is what you're saying is new revelation for me. But, I mean, I've been saying for over a year now that I hate carrying at least a dollar bill in my pocket because that's all... The whole thing is a, is to bail. It's Nimrod. I mean, I call them Nimrods. Uh, but well, you're going to get mean, out shape over it. I mean, it's really easy to get up. When you learn the truth, it's easy to just want to move somewhere else or want to just go give all your money away. It's worthless anyway. And at <laughs> the same time, right. it's like, but it's our means of exchange. What do we do? You know, I'm thinking about Psalm 11, when the foundations are broken, what do the righteous do? Mm. We have to repair the foundations in order to 
lay hold fully of the righteousness, and, and then it's not just in a heart. It's not just a hope or a desire, but it should become the law of the land because it's good for everybody. It's not forcing something on others that's bad. It's giving them righteousness and peace and joy and, and freedom, which is what our country was established for. So I I, I took note of that, and, and I'm sitting there at Jekyll Island suddenly, and, and the rabbi's words were ringing in my spirit, and I'm just weeping yeah. on Jesus. Jesus. We've become subject to something evil. We're, we're being robbed of our souls. Is this going on in your temple in America like it was going on when you turned the tables over in the Temple Mount? Yeah. And the Lord just to me, absolutely it is. And it's not just that, but it's got a blood oath and a covenant with something evil attached to it. And its evil design is to enslave you. And while I'm standing in the parlor, the Holy Spirit says these words to me. He said, son, are you free? I said, yes, I'm free because you made me free. He said, no, you're not. You're a slave. Hmm. Because you have debt that you right. not fully paid off. Yeah, and I said, "Well, yes, Lord, I I know that, but uh, you know, I'm not behind on my bills. I, I'm paying it, and I've asked you to clear my debts. I've asked you to help me get that done, and you've promised me you would." He said, "I know, but you need to understand what's happening today. Why this was so important. Why I needed you to to come here instead of go home." So he said, "Right now." If I gave you the money to pay off all your bills and your house and your car and all your possessions and your credit card, if everything was paid off, would you then be free? And I said, yes, Lord, I, I wouldn't owe anyone anything but to love them. He said, you still wouldn't be free mm. because you're the citizen of the United States. Right. Right now, at this day, you owe about $30,000 just because you're a U.S. citizen, even if your house was paid for and your cars were paid for and you had no other debt. You owe that money because you're a citizen and because your representatives have put that debt on you and because the generation before you was more concerned about what they could have than they were about you as their child. I went, man, Lord, I, I didn't know that the, the deficit was that much for every individual. And he said, well, what I'm about to do is to bring judgment to that, but you need to understand it's going to get worse before it gets better. Right now it's about 30000 but before the year is out, it's going to go up to about 300000 Yeah. And I went, my God, well, what are you getting ready to do? He said, I need you to break this altar. Help me break this altar. And then I'm going to bring a judgment into your land. It's not a judgment on the whole country. It's a judgment on this system that is enslaving my people. He says, I'm going to judge death like I judged slavery in the Civil War. And he said, it is the same thing. Only this system has enslaved the world, not just enslaved you as a citizen. Right. And so I, I said, well, how do we break an altar that I can't see and I can't put my hands on? And I'm in a historical house. I don't want to damage the house. What do I do? And the Lord said something funny to me. He's like, whenever he says my name, it's kind of like Dad. You know, yeah. you know, You know how your dad would call your name and you know, I better pay attention. <laughs> like, yeah, right. Tim, no, Timothy, how big is your spirit? Oh, Lord, I hate it when you ask me questions like that. I, I don't know the answer to that. You know the, you know the answer. Tell me. <laughs> he said, how big do you think your spirit is? I said, I really don't know, Lord. I know that, you know, the word says I sit with you in heavenly places, and I know I'm right here on the earth, and somehow that's possible to be in both places at once. You're in me and I'm in you. I don't really know how to answer you. He said, you're big enough to sit in my realm and stand there at the same time. You 
believe that? Yes. He said, I want you to pray until you can see my face and until you can see the altar in the spiritual realm. Don't worry about the other gentleman. He's he's going to sit quietly while we do my business. I said, all right, Lord. So I started praying, shut my eyes, and began praying intensely. And probably 15 minutes, I began to see in the spiritual realm, and I could see his face. And he was smiling. He was just smiling. It was like he was almost giddy, like he was having fun, getting ready to do something fun. And he's just looking at me. He goes, do this. And he stood next to the altar, and suddenly I could see it, and he's on one side and I'm on the other. And he just says, in my name, and he kicked it. (laughs) And uh, so I kicked my side, he kicked his side. And a similar thing happened. It wasn't quite as dramatic as what had happened over in the Middle East, but suddenly we heard this crack again. I don't get that. I don't know what that's about, but something breaks in the heavens when this kind of stuff is dead. Yeah. And a museum buddy jumps out of his chair. He he realized, he's like, what did you do? He thought I had broke the floor or something. I said, I didn't do anything. I just prayed. He said, well, I just heard a loud noise. What was that? I said, the demonic power that is dealing with this altar is broken. He said, well, what does that mean? What's going to happen now? I said, I'm not really sure, but I know there's going to be a great change that comes with everything that relates to this altar. Hmm. So we, you know, finished our talk and walked out. I thanked him for the day, and I went back to my room. Um, prayed around the around the island a little bit the next day, and um, uh, the rest of the day, and then had my supper and started home. Um, about five days afterwards, after we I was in that parlor, uh, the financial collapse happened here in the United States. No, it's like 2008, was it? Yeah, so it's, uh, uh, what was it, Lehman Brothers announced? Yeah. That was the first thing that, that was, it, it was already, I think, starting to happen behind the scenes, but they came out just uh, less than a week after I was there, announced that they were bankrupt, and that was the beginning of the thing, and then the stock market just took a dive. Um, so AIG, all of that stuff just started unraveling, and next thing you know, we got to have a bailout, and we end up with a, what we were told was a six to seven hundred million or billion dollar bailout. Well, isn't it odd that we have a seven hundred billion dollar bailout, but within a year the deficit goes from about that amount? up to two and a half trillion. Yeah, that's right. How how do you go to two and a half trillion when you only added seven hundred billion? <laughs> yeah. It's because it's not just seven hundred billion. It was seven hundred billion to bail out and then it was a floodgate of printing money to do anything necessary to stop the bleeding of the banks worldwide because the whole system is unraveling that was standing on the power of a blood sacrifice altar. Wow. And uh, all right, hold that thought. God hold, it, hold, it, hold, it, hold that thought for just a second. We got three minutes left in the live feed. The show will continue, but if you want to continue listening, you're going to have to call now, 619-789-6815. Uh, before the live feed drops off, 619-789-6815. Okay, sorry, go ahead, continue. So the what needs to be understood, I want I want the listeners to inquire of the Lord about engaging in spiritual warfare on a scale that we need to step up to a new level. Amen. At the same time, I, 
I don't want them to be zealous to go start commanding demons to get out of the way and not be wise and not walk in God's ways. So we need to get back in the scriptures and say, God, how do you change these things on a national scale? How do you want to deal with this stuff that's idolatrous, that's become normal in our midst? It's not enough to just gripe about the Federal Reserve or to just, you know, gripe at our congressmen for the deficit. The American people were shouting at their representatives to fix the problem, and we were not willing to sell our houses or to sell our cars or to get our nation out of debt. We wanted, we didn't mind. Everybody cheered when more debt was put on to just stop the market from sliding. Right. And what we voted for was slavery for our grandchildren so we could keep our house today. And we've got to change our hearts so the world will never change its. We need to repent for the idolatry that's in God's house. We need to repent for all of the wicked ways that we're using money when we're telling the world we're serving the king of kings. If Christians can't be trusted with financial things, we have no right to ask God to fix our financial system. Right. If we can't be honest with our business with others, then we cannot condemn someone that's wicked on a grand scale. So I've found that the authority to deal with this type of stuff does not come from spiritual warfare. It comes from laying your life down and living righteously and doing in your own life and in all of your ways the things that the same way Jesus would do it if it was him. And if you do both, if you walk in God's ways and you keep the integrity of your heart and you listen and obey what the word of God says, then he'll use any of us, even the three-year-olds, to go out and bring down principalities and powers and dismantle demonic structures because he intends to bring all the nations of the earth into his inheritance. And to do that, we've got to, we've got to unravel some things on a worldwide scale. Well, the thing then I began to ask is I'm headed home and I know the financial system is going to be affected. I'm asking the Lord, how bad is it going to get? What do I need to do to prepare my own house? And the Lord made it clear to me. He says, I am not judging your nation yet, although it's being tested. He says, I'm only judging the bankers right now. But if my people do not respond to me correctly in this and do not watch and pray, this judgment will increase and it will come upon the whole land. Yeah. <clears throat> the last so, thing that I I wanted so, to say that go ahead. Uh well I, I think I think that's important to stress right now, um that th- this judgment is against the 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 what was started on Jekyll Island. It it you know, if in fact that altar was broken and we choose to believe by faith that that sonic boom <laughs> was indicating that something you couldn't see was broken and that shortly thereafter the the markets begin to crash that God is judging the system but we as a people are going to we're, we're going to feel that judgment aren't we well the the difficulty of these things because it's dealing with a national issue is we have to feel the press of that even if we're on the righteous side of it it's going to affect all of us somewhat you know, the market crash. Yeah. The bank control. That means you may not be able to borrow anymore. Well, that's really bad if you in depth up your ears and operate that way. Yeah. But we're affected because we're not following in God's ways. But if we will make adjustments, we should be doing everything possible to get out of debt. We should be helping our brothers and sisters get out of debt. You know, we we need to think differently with how we do normal things. Yeah. But even if we let this run its course and and we survive it personally and prosper through it, still 
we've got a piece of money that wouldn't be of any value whatsoever if we didn't attribute value to it. Our dollars are only worth something because they're measured against something else. And the problem worldwide is every nation today, every nation is operating with fiat currency, and we're the ones that taught them how to do it. So this judgment is bigger than just the Federal Reserve. It's on a system that God does not like because it's it's dependent on being dead. The change that the Federal Reserve did was not just to change the facial picture on the money. What they did is they took the right that our Constitution gave to the Treasury Department to print the money and set the value there. And they said, let us print it for you, and then we'll loan it back to you. Right. Think about the stupidity of that. If, if you just think crazy. wisely, I'm already making something with my own hands, and then somebody yeah. else comes to me and says, let me make that for you, and then I'll loan it back to you. you know? At interest. Why would I, why would I do that? You know, it's mine to start with. I don't need you to print it for me and then charge me interest to have it. But that's what we did. We set that up on a national scale. And and where was the voice of the righteous when that happened? Why was there not a public outcry? It's because we don't understand God very well, and we certainly don't understand his economy. So the reason why it's so grievous and why it, it is a stench in God's nose is because it forces us to have debt or we have no economy. Yeah. You cannot buy anything in this country without a debt being created because if you buy something, that's the reason they print a dollar. So right. You buy a house and you ask for a loan, they print the money so they can give you the loan. That creates debt whether you are borrowing or not. Every sale, every transaction, every exchange has to create a debt now to be done. So that is not necessary, but it is something we chose to allow. And unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, the show uh, cut off right about this point in the broadcast. So this will conclude part one of Canaanite Altars and the Federal Reserve. We will continue our discussion in part two next week on the Revolutionary Radio Project. Good night, everybody.